were that they could be discipled in their walk with Jesus. And so, um, and so that pray for them. So we're going to be in Ephesians this morning. Um, we're going to, we're on a crunch of time. And I am going to cover the entire book of Ephesians somehow in the next um, few minutes. And so if you ate breakfast, you were very smart this morning. If you didn't, um, fasting is good. So <laughs> Ephesians, Ephesians 1, I'm going to read a few verses. Let's go to chapter 2 and just I'll try to highlight this as quickly as possible this morning. Ephesians 1, 1 through 11. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, to the faithful saints in Christ Jesus at Ephesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he lavished on us in the beloved one. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. He had made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he purposed in Christ as a plan for the right time to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth in him. In him, we have also received an inheritance because we were predestined according to the plan of the one who works out everything in agreement with the purpose of his will so that we who had already put our hope in Christ might bring praise to his glory. And if you'd flip over to Ephesians 2, and I'm going to look at verses 11 through verse 22 as well. So then, remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh. You were called the uncircumcised by those called the circumcised, which is done in the flesh by human hands. At one time you were without Christ, excluded from the citizenship of heaven and foreigners to the covenant promise, without hope, without God in the world. But, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace, who had both groups won and torn down the dividing wall of hostility. In his flesh he made no effect the law consisting of commands and expressed in regulations, so that we might create in him one new man from the two, resulting in peace. He did this so that he might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross, by which he put to hostility, he put the hostility to death. He came and proclaimed the good news of peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints, saints and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as a cornerstone. In him, the whole building, being put together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together for God's dwelling in the Spirit. So we are in a segue between two series and Next week, we begin this series on the Apostles' Creed. And the reason we're doing that creed specifically is because, one, I want us to make sure we know what we believe. Um, all of us have beliefs about different things, about God, about Jesus, about sin, about salvation, but not everyone knows what they believe. And so whether you're a Christian or not, do you know what you believe? Do you know what our convictions are? Second, I want to challenge some of your beliefs. It's very easy in our culture to almost take Christianity like a um, Chinese buffet. You pick and choose what you want, right? You like this, you're going to take that. You don't like this, you're going to ignore that. And that's a dangerous thing, right? I like the miracles of Jesus. They're fascinating, but I don't really like this whole conversation about hell or um, judgment. And so I want to make sure we know what we believe and challenge some of your beliefs. But I also want you to understand what it means to be a follower of Jesus, the Apostles' Creed was written um, in a time where there was a lot of challenges to the church, a lot of heresies that were being taught. And so the early church fathers wrote this creed to say, hey, this is at the core of what we believe. At, if you believe this, you identify with us. If you don't believe these basic things, there's concern there. And so we want to look at these um, 
point, so we're going to study this over the nine weeks and look at that and study um, what it means to be a follower of Jesus, and we're going to use the creed as our guide to do that. But two weeks ago when, we, when I was here, um, we talked about being disciples, of being a follower of Jesus, of that more than anything else, what our desire and our prayer is that you would be fully devoted followers of Jesus, um, that you would be disciples. And so this week I want to dive and press in a little bit more of what does a disciple look like? What does it mean to be a disciple? What does it mean for us to find our identity in Jesus? What does that mean that if you say that you're a follower of Jesus, if you say that you're a Christian, if you say that you're a believer, what does that look like in your life? See, throughout our lives, we hit different seasons where we're forced to ask certain questions of who we are. If you're a teenager, you run into this. You become more and more independent, sometimes to the detriment or the frustration of your parents. You're no longer just so-and-so's kid, but you're trying to figure who you are. So who are you? How do you identify your values, your significance, your story, your heritage, your identity? How does that shape what you do, how you're going to live, what you're becoming? And then you get to the point of midlife crisis where having answered those questions when you were younger and having set certain expectations and dreams about your life um, and what it would look like, we come upon some unexpected event or some major life change and we're somehow awoken to the reality that we aren't who we thought we were going to be. We look maybe back in regret and disappointment on all we could have accomplished by now. Maybe finding a spouse or having a child or getting the corner office or owning a home. Or we look back at all that we've lost. Maybe it's a tragic health crisis or a layoff or the simple course of life leaves us with an empty nest, expensive tuition bills or whatnot. And we wonder, is this what I worked so hard for? Is this all there is? And we become completely disoriented about who we are. And then there's the end of life identity crisis. There's really not a lot much forward to look forward to. No longer many opportunities to do things different. And all you do is look back and you evaluate. And again, you ask yourselves, who am I? Who was I? Did it really matter? How did I spend my life? And the temptation in all of these stages is to try and find our identity in what we do or what we fail to do or what we have or what we don't have or what others think of us or what others have done to us. But as the book of Ephesians tells us, if your faith is in Jesus, you aren't what has been done to you, but you are what Jesus has done for you. You aren't what you do, but you are what Jesus has done. What you do doesn't determine who you are. Rather, who you are in Jesus determines who you are in what you do. Our identity needs to be shaped in the gospel of Christ, the good news of God, what God has done to establish his kingdom and deal with the sin in our lives through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And this is true not just for us as individuals, but it's also true for us as a community, as a church. Who we are flows out of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. Our identity comes with our union or our relationship with Jesus, and who we are shapes what we do. Our activity is shaped by our identity. The question of identity is crucial for us to answer, especially in a day and time and age where we can be known for a lot of things. Our prayer is that we would be known first and foremost as people who love Jesus with everything that we have. We could be easily identified by what political party we're associated with. We could be easily identified with what social justice issue we fight for, and none of these things are wrong, but they're not primary. If those things do not flow out of our identity with Jesus, it will leave us hopeless, it will leave us discouraged. So it has to flow out of our identity with Jesus. It's incredibly easy for us to find our identity in other things. So we've got to ask the question, how does the gospel, how does this book that we read week in and week out, this book that, we, that shows us of how sinful we are and how gracious God is, how does that shape our identity? How does it inform the way that we live our lives to be a gospel-centered community living each day on mission for Jesus? How does this help us as a church to think less as something that we go to but more is something that we are. 
a family of missionary servants empowered by God's Spirit to make disciples for Jesus. So that's our task this morning, to think through these questions and the practical implications. And the book of Ephesians is going to be our guide. And we're going to go all over Ephesians this morning. So keep your Bibles open. Um, and hopefully your fingers are fast enough to find the different chapters if you have got an app this morning. So the book of Ephesians is written by the Apostle Paul to a church in the ancient city of Ephesus. And it has much to teach us about how the gospel shapes our identity of who we are in Jesus Our identity, not just as individuals, but as a church. The phrase, in Christ, or in him, or some version of that is used 23 times in six chapters. And our essential identity, as this book frames, is that we are a new people with whom God dwells and through whom God displays his glory. That is who we are. That we are a people with whom the creator of the universe dwells And with whom and through whom he displays his glory. More practically speaking, through our union with Jesus, we are a family of worshipers, a family of learners, a family of servants, a family of missionaries in whom Christ dwells by his spirit and through whom he displays his glory, his beauty, his incomparable worthiness. And embracing this identity, a family of worshipers, learners, servants, and missionaries who by God's spirit bring glory to Jesus has everything to do about who we are as a church. It affects our motivations. It affects our expectations. It affects our goals, our dreams, and we need to embrace who we are in Jesus if we're really going to live faithfully as a gospel-centered community on mission for Jesus. So we're going to think about these five realities of who we are in Jesus. One, we're a family. Two, we're worshipers. Three, we're learners. Four, we're servants. And five, we're missionaries. And we are going to zoom through this as quickly as possible. Let's begin with family. One of the ways that Ephesians helps us understand who we are is by contrasting who we used to be apart from Jesus. Chapter 2, verse 1 reminds us that you were dead in trespasses and sins which you previously lived according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and we were by nature children under wrath as others were as also. Rebels who live life on our own terms to our own spiritual death and also the judgment of God. Paul is writing to a predominantly Gentile or a non-Jewish church. Those whose heritage does not enjoy the covenant promises of God. Paul reminds them in verse, chapter 2 verse 12, at one time you were without Christ. You were excluded from citizenship and you were foreigners to the covenant promise you were without hope you were without god that's a pretty bleak identity but it captures so well the disorientation the loneliness the shame the rebellion the foolishness of a life that's apart from jesus a life that is still marks our world today of life where our identity is in what we do or what we have or what we long for and where None of that is enough for us. We stand before the Father as children of wrath, deserving his just judgment without hope, without God in this world. Listen, if you're here this morning and you're exploring Christianity and trying to figure out what all this means, that might sound pretty harsh to you. But Paul is being brutally honest about the disappointment and judgment of a life apart from Jesus because he wants us to see the incredible, life-changing truth of finding our hope and our identity in Jesus. In Jesus, God is doing something new in this broken world. The book of Ephesians opens with this incredible praise to God for his salvation toward us that has come in the climax in the death and life and resurrection of Jesus. We read it earlier in chapter 1, verses 3 to 14, that God has been at work since the foundation of his world to choose a people for himself by his grace, to redeem us from sin, to forgive us, to adopt us into his family, to make us heirs of his kingdom. He's done all of this according to the purposes of his will. 
for the praise of his glory in order to magnify his name and his worthiness. And at the center of it all, the grand plan of God was that it spanned all of time and all of history. And at the center of all of that is Jesus, whom God set forth as a plan for the right time to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth to come. In Jesus, God is putting a broken and rebellious world back together. And he's starting by taking broken people you and I, a people who were dead in our transgressions and our sins and making them alive with Christ. Not only is he putting individual lives back together, he's putting communities and all of humanity back together. Chapter 2 tells us that he's taking two groups of sinners, Jews and Gentiles, non-Jews, who were divided and used to be hostile toward each other and is creating in them now one new family. Chapter 2, verse 14, he is our peace who made both groups one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility. God is making one new family in Jesus. And friends, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have been invited into that family, not because of anything you've done, but as Paul says in chapter two, by grace, we have been saved. Simply by believing in Jesus. Grace is God's undeserved favor being given something wonderful when we deserve something terrible. It's the picture of sitting in a dungeon, isolated, alone, awaiting execution because of your high treason against the king. And then all of a sudden you receive notice. Not only have you been pardoned, but now you've been legally adopted into the king's own family. You are forgiven. You are accepted. You're no longer under judgment and you're no longer alone. But now you have a seat at the table of the king. You are loved by the father forever. And it's not because of anything you and I have done, friends, but because the king's own son chose to put his head in the guillotine in your place. Friends, that's grace. And it's by grace that God makes us into a new family, a new people, if we believe. So the question is, what does it mean to live like a family? Or more specifically, what does it mean to live like a family of forgiven and rescued sinners whose identity is secure in Jesus? How do we become more family? How do we become brother, better, better brothers and sisters in Jesus? How do we become a family that flows out of the gospel? A family tells truth to one another. It doesn't take advantage of one another. A family is humble, patient, and forgiving. If grandma burns the rolls at Thanksgiving or messes up the stuffing, you don't go looking for a new grandma for next year. You still stick with her. And even when a family makes a mistake, even when we take advantage of each other, or we somehow hurt or sin against one another. As a family, we work hard to preserve that unity. We fight for reconciliation when conflict divides, taking the gospel of Jesus seriously, that if the grace of God in Christ was sufficient to deal with our sins against God, it is sufficient for us to deal with our sins against each other. That's family. Not to be overly graphic here, But if you lose your finger by being careless with a knife when you're cooking or a saw when you're building something, the goal isn't that you leave that finger there. The goal is you get it reattached as quickly as possible, right? And yet so often, we're content to let members of the body lay wounded and neglected rather than moving toward them in humility and repentance in accordance with the identity that we have as the family of God. When we see someone hurting, we go to them. We care for them. We love them. When you see someone not here, you reach out to them and say, hey, what's going on? We miss you. Your family, our body is incomplete because you're not here. We need one another. Not simply because we can accomplish more together, which we can, but because we genuinely love one another. And we need each other to help us cling daily to the love and grace that we have in Jesus, the head of our family. In Christ, we are a new family that not only flows out of the gospel, but as we come and do life together, 
It points us back to the gospel by our constant reminder of our need for Jesus together. Constant reminder of our identity, our security, our calling, and our hope. But we don't exist simply as a family for ourselves. As God's people in Christ, we have a purpose, a calling. And the text and the next four identities help us understand what our purpose is. So we're a family, but what kind of family are we? Number two, we're a family of worshipers. We're worshipers. What marks us as different from any other social club that's gathering is that we're here not for ourselves, we're here for Jesus. We're worshipers. Our chief goal is to make much of God and his glory. To worship means to treat something like God, to delight in and depend on someone or something as your ultimate joy and hope. Friends, worshiping God is central to our identity as the new family of God. Displaying God's worth was the explicit aim of God's great plan of salvation in the book's opening praise in chapter 1. Three times Paul tells us that the purpose of the salvation, all three times it goes back to something like this, to the praise of God's glory. Why did he save us? To the praise of his glory. Similarly, the glory of God is the aim of Paul's prayer in chapter 3. To him be glory in the church and in Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Being members of God's new family is not about us. It's about God. We're not here simply to make sure that we're filled. We're here so that we can bring worship and praise to God. And one of the ways that Ephesians makes this point clear is by showing how the church is the new temple of God. Listen to how Paul describes our identity in Christ at the end of chapter 2, verse 19. So then you're no longer foreigners and strangers, but you're fellow citizens with the saints. You're members of God's household built on the foundations of the apostles and the prophets when Christ Jesus himself was the cornerstone. In him, the whole building being put together grows into the holy temple of the Lord. In him, we are also being built together for God's indwelling in the spirit. See, in the Old Testament, the temple was a building where the glory of God dwelt among his people on the earth in a special way. It's where the Israelites would go to meet God who was in heaven to behold his beauty, to receive his mercy and the sacrifices offered for sins and to worship and give him glory. We're told over and over again that the temple of God was filled with the glory of God. But when God takes on human flesh in Jesus, there was no longer a need for a temple building. Jesus' body was the very presence of God on earth, the fullness of his glory. And as the new people of God, united in Christ and indwelled by his spirit, we are that body, the temple, the fullness of him who fills all of us. The temple is about God's presence and God's glory. And as we said earlier, in Christ, we're a new people in whom God dwells and through whom he displays his glory. We are to be a family of worshipers whose lives are all about Jesus. We are to be a family of worshipers that you newborn moms and dads, when you're changing diapers, that is worship before God. Because you're saying, God, thank you for this child that I get to change a diaper. When you are eating a meal, that's what Corinthians says, right? Whatever you do, whether it's eating or drinking, do it for the glory of God. When you're eating, you're worshiping, saying, God, thank you that I get a meal to eat. When you wake up in the morning, you say, God, thank you that I get another day to live. When you put your head down to sleep, you say, God, thank you that you protected me throughout this entire day. That your life is worship before God. Friends, this is what we need to be identified by. That everything that we have, everything that we are, is because of God's goodness and kindness. And in worship, we live our lives. We're to be worshipers. What does that look like practically? It means that worship is not simply coming to a place, i.e. a building. We are the church. Wherever we gather, wherever we go, God is among us to make himself known, to extend his mercy, and to display his glory among us. Second, it means that whatever we do, whether we gather together under God's word on a Sunday morning, 
where we get together in our missional community groups or we're doing a outreach together as a community group or we're getting together in our men's and women's Bible studies, whatever we're doing when we're linking arms, serving God together, whatever it does, it's not ultimately about us, but about him and his renown. It must be shaped by his word and it must be aimed for his glory. See, every one of us faces the temptation of hijacking our lives or even hijacking a ministry in order to make it about me. It's like, oh, I didn't get my needs met today. I didn't get my desires, my goals, my preferences, my values, my needs. And in order to protect our idolatrous desires, we gladly demonize the alternatives as to make, as to make them look bad and us look good. Some of us, our hearts are so dark that we could take something as so God-honoring as preaching of God's word or singing praise or telling others about him and use those things to make it all about us. To be like, look what I've done. You don't hear anything about Jesus, you just hear about what you did to seek your own praise. But if we're to be a community shaped by the gospel whose identity as worshipers is rooted in Jesus, then being true to who we are means surrendering all of us to God and his word, trusting the power of his spirit to do so and making the chief aim of our lives, not to make our name famous, but as, the, as John the Baptist says, more of him, less of me. That needs to be the aim of our lives, brothers. Sisters, that needs to be the aim of our lives, that we're not talking about how good we are or what we've done, but we're constantly pointing people to Jesus in all that we do. We're a family of worshipers. Number two, we're a family of learners. Number three, there's another word for that. We've heard it a lot this morning. We're to be disciples. One of the most, one of the sometimes frustrating realities of being recipients of God's redeeming work is that there's still more redemption to be done in our lives. Man, if God saved us and made us perfect right away, it would have been so much easier, right? But even after you encountered God's grace, and even if you, after you encountered God's love, you still struggle with sin, you still struggle with temptations. You still struggle with your own desires and your own wants. We haven't become what we're called to be yet. And so God calls us to be disciples, which means that as a family of worshipers in whom God dwells and through whom he displays his glory, none of us have arrived. If the person next to you thinks they arrived, smack, smack them across the top of their head. They haven't. They need Jesus just as much as you need Jesus. We live in a fallen world. We still make stupid mistakes and we act selfishly. And so following Jesus as his disciples means that we are continual learners, eager to look at God's word and be changed by God's spirit to look more and more like Jesus every single day. In chapter 4, Paul talks about the necessity of us working together as one family to mature in Christ so that we would display his glory. And Christ has given specific leadership to the church for this very purpose. Chapter 4, verse 11, he says, He gave, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers, equipping the saints for the work of ministry. What are we doing? We're equipping you for the work of ministry, to build up the body of Christ until we reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of God's Son, growing in maturity with a stature measured by God's fullness, then we will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning and cleverness in the technique of design and deceit. There's temple language right there. The fullness of Christ. The display of God's glory. We must, friends, be continually changed by the gospel in order to display the glory of Jesus in and through our lives to grow deeply in love with Jesus and to grow more hatred for the sin that entangles us and so reflect the character and the image of Jesus to one another and to a watching world. Are you a learner? Are you simply content with showing up on Sunday morning or are you someone that says, God, I need you day in and day out? Are you someone who recognizes that you haven't arrived? who submit to God's word, who depend daily on the grace of the gospel, who look to God's spirit to change you, who look to one another to help you grow so that you become equipped to do the mission that God has called you to do. Notice in chapter 4, that verse that I read, it's not that those of us who are gifted or called to lead 
are the ones who are supposed to do the ministry. Rather, those who are gifted prepare all of us together for the works of service. We need to do this together. You're called to the mission field wherever you are. And that brings us to our fourth and fifth identities. Number four, we are a family of servants. In Jesus, we are a family of worshipers, we're a family of learners, but we're also servants who express God's love to one another by laying down our lives after the pattern of Jesus. That's our fourth identity. We're servants. Ephesians 5 says this way, Therefore, be imitators of God as dearly loved children. Walk in love as Christ also loved and gave himself for us, a sacrificial offering to God. Essential to our identity as God's family, God's children, is following his pattern of life-giving, sacrificial service. Listen, to be a servant is not a particularly glorious vocation. The word is actually translated slave or bondservant. J.I. Packer says it this way, whether being a servant is a matter of shame or pride depends on whose servant you are. Depends on whose servant you are. By God's spirit, we have been united with the one who did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Friends, being a servant is about denying ourselves so that we can bless others. See, our natural tendency is to protect ourselves, even to promote ourselves. We're more comfortable when others work hard to serve and bless us. Being a servant messes up our world. It messes up our plans. Very rarely when you are a servant and willing to serve others, do people call you ahead of time to schedule a crisis moment. The question is, do you love your schedule more than you love your family? Do you love comfort more than you love Jesus? Or do we look at the gospel and see the incredible love and length to which Jesus not only inconvenienced himself for us, but laid down his very life, not only in the excruciating pain of the cross, but in the incomprehensible horror of taking on himself the judgment of God Do we look at the gospel and the love of Christ and joyfully express that love toward others in our sacrificial service? See, our identity in Jesus calls us to have servant hearts and servant hands. Being willing to be inconvenienced and get dirty in helping others know the love and beauty of Jesus. Whether that service expresses itself in marriages and families, which is what Paul is calling us to in Ephesians 5 and 6, or whether it calls us, expresses itself in, to others in the body and those outside the body, which Paul excludes to in chapter 3, service is essential as our identity as a family of Jesus in whom God dwells and through whom he displays. How are you serving? Who are you serving? When's the last time you reached out to someone and said, hey, how can I bless you? When's the last time you simply inconvenienced yourself and said, hey, let's share a meal together just so we could just to be together? When's the last time you said, hey, I can take some time and serve somewhere? And I'm not talking about serving in the church. When's the last time you were approaching life from a servant's heart? And last thing, in Christ, we are missionaries. In Jesus, we're a family of worshipers, learners, servants, and missionaries who spread God's glory through our message and our love. Friends, mission is not something that we are to do. It is essential to who we are in Jesus. If the love of Jesus has transformed you, you ought to be living your lives in such a way that people see it. In the Gospel of John, when Jesus commissioned the apostles to be his ambassadors to the world about the life-changing salvation available that was only in Jesus. He said to them, as the Father sent me, so I am now sending you. Do you hear that? Just as Jesus was sent by the Father, Jesus now sends you and I. And we read it earlier in Ephesians 4. It's not about those who are gifted to do the work of the ministry 
Rather, those who are gifted prepare God's people for the work of service. All of us have a role to play in advancing God's kingdom. We're all missionaries at whatever sphere of influence God has given us. Are you pointing your children to Jesus? Do your neighbors know that you love Jesus? Do your coworkers see that you are different because of your identity in Jesus? See, we usually reserve the term missionary to folks like Shannon and Lindsay who serve God vocationally in cross-cultural contexts, and that's fine. As long as we don't fool ourselves into thinking that our, our calling is somehow different. I'm not talking about how we make a living, but how we use everything that we have to make Christ known to those who otherwise will face eternity in hell without Jesus. If in Christ, friends, we are missionaries then clearly our desire is to see more and more people come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. We want to see lives changed. We want to see God receive the glory due to his name. How does that identity shape what we do when we gather? Are you willing to invite people into your homes that don't know Jesus? Are you willing to invite a coworker to community group to see what the body of Christ looks like? how they love each other, how they share a meal together, how they care for one another? Are you willing to invite family members or coworkers to come worship with us on a Sunday morning? And if you see someone new here, do they feel welcome because you've reached out to them and you embrace them and you get to know them? We used to joke that if you're new and you're here visiting for the first time, You might be the last person that leaves because so many people talk to you. But is that still true? Is that still our identity? That we embrace new people and we love them and show them what it means to be the family of God? Would they see a love that's shared among us that reflects the beauty and love of Jesus? Would they be able to look at our lives and our actions and worship and begin to get a sense of what the difference that Jesus makes in our lives? And second, if we're a family of missionaries, How does that shape our lives when we're scattered throughout the week? As we live out our mission, do we look for opportunities to point people to Jesus, to love and serve our neighbors? What ways might our congregation be a blessing to Richardson? How might those of you who live in Plano or Frisco work together to serve our neighbors and our communities there? Or those in Richardson teaming together to live as a community on mission in Richardson? Or those of you guys in Garland or Sunnyvale or Mesquite or Rowlett or Plano or Allen or Frisco or Wiley or McKinney or Carrollton or Dallas. And if I missed any of your cities, include your cities right there, trying to make sure you're not missed. We are to be on mission wherever we are. What about you those on the campus of UTD or Richland? Are you living simply for your own lives or do you realize that God has put you there to be on mission for Jesus. See, one of the unique challenges of us as a congregation is that we're quite spread out. We come from all over the Metroplex. There's also a unique opportunity because God has placed us throughout the Metroplex in such a way that as a congregation, we could have potentially wide impact for Jesus. He's given us a variety of relationship in a variety of places throughout this region. What might we do as a family of missionaries to make most of the relationships that God has put us in for the sake of the gospel. Who we are flows out of who, what Je- who Jesus is. What we do flows out of what Jesus has done. Our identity comes from our union in Christ. And who we are shapes what we do. Our activity has to be shaped by our identity. As we move toward the vision that God has given us to be a gospel-centered community living every day on mission for Jesus, can I invite you? But if this is not you, would you join us on this mission? Would you join us to be family together? Don't be just pew sitters who quickly disappear each week. Be a family of worshipers who worship Jesus with everything that they have. To be a family of learners who say that this book needs to shape my convictions on everything that I believe. 
to be a family of servants who will serve wherever there's opportunities because it's not about me, it's about Jesus. To be a family of missionaries who will live our lives on mission for Jesus. Time's up, I gotta go. So, <laughs> it's time for communion. Some of you will get upset with me because lunch is late. So, um, we've got some, we've got time for communion as we sing and as we worship this morning. Everything that I talked about only is a reality because of what this table represents. That if Jesus didn't have his body broken for us, if Jesus didn't have his blood spilled for us, none of this conversation matters. But this matters because of what Jesus did for us. I said it numerous times this morning. This is not something we've done. This is something that was done for us. And so there is nothing that we can boast in. There is nothing that we could take credit in. We come as worshipers acknowledging, Jesus, this is what you have done for us. And so when we come to the table this morning, I'm going to invite you. Would you reflect on the finished work of Jesus for you? What he has done, how he has saved you, how he has redeemed you, how he's rescued you. And would you come to the table and worship, acknowledging that he is a good savior who loves you, has given his life for you. If you're not a believer here this morning, can I earnestly plead with you? Don't leave here this morning without knowing Jesus. If you need someone to talk to, there are people in the back that would love to pray with you. But if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, can I invite you this morning before you leave, talk to someone back there, talk to me, because we would love to say that you are part of our family, that you are part of the family of God, and we want that for you. And so if that's you, pray with them. If you're here this morning and you just want prayer for something, you've had a rough week, you've had a long week, there's people in the back that are available to pray with you. Would you go meet with them before prayer? But the way that we do communion here, the worship team's about to sing, we're about to just worship. Whenever you're ready, would you come, grab the elements from the table? And whenever you are get back to your seat, why don't you just remain standing as we sing and we close our worship this morning? And so we'll worship that way. Can I pray for you?